something new. And something new. It's, it's funny. And anybody in here a movie fan? You just like to watch movies? I love to watch movies. And, and the best thing is, is I'll rewatch a movie over and over and over. I make a joke that like I'm at that stage of my life that my kids are all out. They're 21, 17, and 14. And so they'll go out on a Friday night and I have a Friday night free. And rather than calling up some friends and saying, hey, do you want to hang out? I run to Fairway. I get a steak. I get a Caesar salad and some roasted potatoes. I'll cook it up and I'll sit down and I'll watch Moneyball for the 75th time. But here's the thing. I find something new every single time I watch the movie. It's just like that with the Word of God. How many times have you read the same story over and over and over again, and yet you find something new? Because you're in a new season, because you're in a new place, because you read it through a different set of eyes, because for whatever reason, there's something new. And so parents, hear me when I say this. We have this great opportunity to train our children up to know the Lord, and even when they're old, the truth will not depart from them. So that being said, today I get the joy and the honor and the privilege, PTE D Mama, thank you so much for this opportunity. Like, here's the thing. Not only do I get a chance to preach, but I get a chance to preach to you like I would talk to kids and teenagers today. Does that sound good? So adults in the room, uh, I need you to go back. For some of you, it might just be a couple of years. For some of you, it may be a little bit longer. But today, we're just gonna, we're gonna get into the Word, and I just wanna story tell it, and I wanna tell it. So actually, though, in order to, to read the Word of God, I, I love this thing that they used to do in the ancient tradition of the church, which is they would stand for the reading of the Word of God. And I thought, I'm gonna be up here talking enough, so I actually asked Lauren, one of my Rev students, to come up here and just read the Orange Bible. So will, will you welcome Lauren to the stage? And then will everybody else, will you stand up, please? The words won't be on the screen. And so here's the thing. I'm just going to invite you not to be in your Bibles even, but just to listen to the word of God being proclaimed as Lauren reads. I'll have you read just this, this column. Okay. One day as we, Paul and Silas, were going down to the place of prayer, we met a demon-possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned a lot of money for her masters. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went, on a di this went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and instantly it left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were shattered, and now they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them to the place before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city in an uproar because of the Jews. They shouted to the city office officials, they are... They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and they were thrown into prison. The jail was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet into the stocks. Outstanding. Can you guys give it up for Lauren? Well, Father God, today we pray that these words would not stay, um, that they would land where you want them to land, that they would pierce the hearts that they need to pierce, that they would move in powerful ways, that today, Lord, would you work through your word in our lives? Would you guide us, lead us, and direct us in your ways? And would you train us in your ways everlasting? It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. So I actually only had Lauren read the first part of the story. And so what I want to do real quick is I just want to story tell what she said, and then we're going to jump into the word, right? So if you heard, right, there's these two guys named Paul. Somebody say Paul. Paul. And Silas. Somebody say Silas. Silas. Uh, Lauren actually said it in the Greek, Silas, um, right? So it's good. We're good, 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 good. Cool, cool, cool. Banana, banana, tomato, tomato, potato, potato. Like, however you say it. I love the fact that she read it with confidence, right? Hey, by the way, quick trip, uh, quick tip, kids in the room. If you get to a word in the Bible that you don't know how to say, just say it with confidence, right? Or you can be like PT and just make up something. So like when he gets to Sen uh, uh, Sennacherib, he goes, I'm going to call him Sennacherib, snack on a rib, right? 
Like you just make it up or you call him Joe or call him something for short. Just speak it with confidence, all right? All right, moving on, right? So in our story today, we meet Paul and we meet Silas, right? These two guys who are disciples of the Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, disciples. disciples. Turn to your neighbor that you didn't choose and say, you're a disciple. disciple. Turn around to somebody behind you and say, you're a disciple. Because here's the reality, even though Paul and Silas are disciples, right, what ends up happening in our story today is we're encouraged that we're disciples of Jesus as well. So we can learn from Paul and Silas. Also, I just want to point something out. I love that Paul and Silas are together because we are better together, right? And also, by the way, there's a beautiful model that's here, right, where we get the opportunity to be poured into. So when Paul was Saul and he was converted, or when he was changed and converted to Jesus, what ends up happening, a guy named Ananias comes around him and a guy named Barnabas comes along around him to teach him, to train him, to pour into him, right? And then later on, Paul would get the opportunity to pour into guys like Titus and Timothy, the same way that he'd been poured into, but Paul knows you don't do life alone, that you need to be surrounded. So he had guys like Silas, he had guys like Philemon, he had guys like Mark Luke, he had these guys around him that were here. So it's this beautiful thing, if you put yourself in the spot, you're being poured into, you're pouring out into, but you're also doing life together. And when we do this, our walk can grow. Kids in the room, your parents are pouring into you. You guys get the opportunity with your friends to do life together, to teach people about Jesus at your schools, and as you get older, you'll get the opportunity to pour down into. We actually are modeling this within our whole next generation program here at Love Kids, or at Love Church. Let me tell you how. Can I, real quick, before we get into the story? This is really cool, I love this. If you come over to Love Kids, and you should, and you come over to serve, one of the things that you'll notice is we have a great crew of adult leaders. But you know what we have even more of? Teen leaders. We have a whole crew of middle school students that are pouring down into the, next, into the love kids. Also, in our Rev Mid ministry, which is our middle school ministry, we have seniors that show up the last Wednesday of every month, giving up their small group time to come and spend it with middle school students to pour into Rev Mid students. And within our Rev ministry, we have a whole lot of young adults that are pouring into the high school students. So catch this, young adults, 18 to 30, pouring into high school students, high school students pouring into middle school students, middle school students pouring into kids alongside parents who are doing it all. See, we have this opportunity to be poured into and to be poured out of, like to be poured down into. And when we do this, the church flourishes. Okay, tangent done. Back to the Bible. Okay, so Paul and Silas one day, they're out and they're preaching the gospel, which is just what they do because they live lives that are sent. They are constantly walking, teaching, training, telling people about Jesus. PGM would be so proud of Paul and Silas, right? Out there teaching, preaching, and everything. One day they're out, and all of a sudden this girl comes up behind them and starts just yelling things. She's demon-possessed, and she's going around telling them that they are servants of the Most High God, right? Hey, servants of the Most High God, servants of the Most High God. Now, on paper, you might be sitting there thinking, well, this is a good thing, But here's the thing, if I'm a follower of Jesus, I don't need demons writing my letter of recommendation. And so finally, Paul gets exasperated, exhausted, annoyed, parents in the room. Never happens, right? When your kids are walking around you, mom, 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 dad, 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 mom said, mom said, dad said, dad said, okay, just go, just go to your room. And so Paul says, go to your room. Demon, get, be gone. Get out. Be gone. And suddenly, she's free. Somebody say free. free. This girl is free. She's free from her demonic oppression. She's free. Everybody should be celebrating, cheering, rejoicing, right? They should be doing all of that. Instead, her owners are like, oh, heck no, you did not. They said worse words, but I can't say them in church. They were really upset. So they grab Paul and Silas, who just set her free, and they drag her in front of the council, or drag them in front of the council, and they say that these men are troublemakers. 
Students in the room, kids in the room, if you tell people about Jesus and you love people like Jesus, you will be called a troublemaker. Because the way of Jesus is not of this world. And the sad truth is, is that when we love people well, it causes people to look inside, see their unlove, and get angry. Paul and Silas did the most loving thing that they could. They set a girl free, and they were called troublemakers. Not only that, they were called troublemakers, but everybody gets so upset, they strip off their clothes and they start to just beat them with rods. Over and over and over, they beat them with rods. Guys, if you're gonna follow Jesus, you're gonna do the right thing, you're gonna say the right truths, and you're gonna be attacked, beaten, and in some case, thrown into prisons that you don't deserve to be in. Here's the thing, kids in the room right now, like the, prison, the biggest prison we have is our room, I think, right? We get thrown in our room or we get the craziest prison ever. We get our phones taken away. <laughs> what am I gonna do? By the way, parents, greatest form of discipline, take away their phones. Take away their screens. Ground them, that's cool. I'll just be on my device. Take away their phones. Mm -mm -mm -mm. My kids right now are like, oh. okay, anyway. <laughs> they're beaten, they're attacked, and then they're thrown into prison. Not only just thrown into prison, but actually I need to scoot into the light. I feel like a dog right now. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a, not a good choice. <laughs> Can we delete that from the video? All right, sometimes I don't think. <laughs> Next generation pastor. All right, so they get, they put, the, j the jailer is so afraid of them that he doesn't just put them into prison, he doesn't just put them into jail, but he actually puts them in the inner cell. And when he puts them in the inner cell, it says he also puts their feet in stocks. Now, we can sit there and think, okay, that's the thing with two holes, but if you've ever seen the stocks back then, it actually wasn't just two holes, it was usually like eight to 10. Because depending on how bad of a prisoner you were, you could start here. But if you were worse, you'd be here. If you were worse, you'd be here. And Denise hasn't taught me enough about yoga, so I'm gonna go here. So we don't know how it was, but most likely it was very uncomfortable. And so here, here's the thing. Paul and Silas are sitting in prison. They've been beaten. So their backs are toe up from the flow up. They are hurting. Their feet are in stocks. And my guess is, is if I was in Paul and Silas's shoes, my response would be tears. Kids in the room, what about you? Any kid in the room get a spanking? Don't raise your hand right now. It's okay. Cool, cool, cool. I know. Every, there's adults in the room. They're like, yep. Still remember the rod of discipline. But, I mean, here's the thing, parents. Our kids cry. If you've been beaten over and over with rods, like Paul and Silas could sit there and, and they could probably sit there and think all the things. Woe is me. I did the right thing and this is what I got. I got beaten. I got attacked. I got falsely accused. And I got thrown into prison and now I'm in a prison. I don't deserve this. This isn't fair. Where are you, God? How dare you do this to me? Don't you know what I've been doing? I've been going all around. I've been preaching your word. God, where are you? Been there? Done that? By the way, God wants your complaints. If you don't believe me, go to the Psalms and you'll see that David would take his complaints to the Lord. Can I tell you what we do wrong? Oftentimes, we take our complaints about the Lord to our friends. And what God says is, bring your complaints to me and let me go to work. 
So here's the thing. It would have been okay if Paul and Silas had been sitting in jail and they'd have been sitting there going, God, where are you? How long will you hide your eyes from me? Like, why are you letting us endure this? Why can I, why did I get beat? Why am I in jail? Why am I in these stocks? It would have been okay if they'd have taken it to God. They weren't sitting there going like this. Hey, Silas, can you believe this? Bro, if Paul, like seriously, if you could have just calmed down a little bit and not got annoyed, like you are such, oh, this is your fault, Paul. What, my fault, Silas. You're the one that brought us to this town. And by the way, why are we doing this ministry? He's like, I don't know, Paul. I don't know, Silas. I don't know, Margo. <sighs> my Christmas vacation fans. Okay, moving on. Ah, focus, focus. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Somebody say, what? Around midnight, Paul and Silas were complaining, were grumbling, were frustrated, were crying, were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. I wonder, I wonder what they were singing. Were they singing, I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I'm gonna skip forward. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the prison floor louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar. The ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. Could Paul and Silas have not just been sitting there quietly praying, quietly complaining? Instead, they declare louder and louder, louder and louder. You're going to hear my praises roar. Hallelujah. The word literally means praise, hallel, the Lord, Yahweh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Literally, they're singing out praises to the Lord in here. They're praying. And what are the other prisoners doing? Shut up. Knock it off. Stop singing. You're annoying. No, they're listening. Is it possible that sometimes the places that we go that seem so brutal and terrible and awful are actually the places that we need to go so that others can hear our praises? See, the title of this sermon is When Worship Changes a Family. However, the first thing that I need us to say is that they are praying and praising. Turn to your neighbor and say, praying. praying. Turn to your other neighbor and say, praising. That's right, they are praying and they are praising. Now, how can they be doing this? It's because they know the promises of God. Here's the thing, they are sitting in this prison right now and they are fully surrendered to God. They are fully surrendered to his plan. They are fully surrendered to whatever he has for them. They are fully surrendered to his call in their life. They have no doubts, no fears, no, no questions about the fact that they've proclaimed the gospel, that they've gone to people, that they sent that demon out of their girl in the power and the authority of Jesus' name because they are surrendered to God. That's why they can sing. Because when we are surrendered, we can sing. Also, by the way, they're also together. Have I mentioned that yet? That we're better together? When we are surrounded, we can sing. But here's the thing, they know the promises of God. Because they know the promises of God, they can sing these out, they can know. So if, if the first statement is praying and praising, the other one, the second thought, if you're a note taker, and if you try to take notes with me, good, good luck. <laughs> Squirrel. <laughs> you got to take notes up here and then down here. Okay, right there. Right? But if you are, say promises. Turn to, your, turn to the person behind you and say promises. It's because they know the promises of God. Check this out. Because they were praying, because they were praising, because they trusted the promises, suddenly 
there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. How many prisoners? Okay, now I do gotta tell you a secret, by the way. In the Greek here, the word every means every. <laughs> right? The chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Okay, so check this, right? They're sitting there in, in the jail. They're praying, they're praising because of the promises of God, right? And all of a sudden, boom, the ground is shaken, like crazy shaken. And I'm not talking about just little earthquake shaken. I'm talking big earthquake shaken because suddenly they're out of their shackles. All the chains are gone and they are free. Like Bob Wiley in What About Bob? Free. Like William Wallace in Braveheart? Freedom. They are free and they can run and they can get out of there. Here's the thing at that, at that specific moment, it would have been easy for them to think to themselves, surely this is God's hand. Surely God has set us free. By the way, there's a whole lot of other prisoners in there. When I say a whole lot of, it might've been three. It might've been 30. We don't know. So make it up in your head. Go do whatever you want. Cool, 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 cool. Right. But all of the other prisoners and Paul and Silas don't move. Paul and Silas, I can understand. But what about the other prisoners? These are bad men and women. Nefarious. Been imprisoned. Maybe they've been falsely accused, but here's the thing. Up until this point, they were in prison because they'd done something wrong. And suddenly they're free and they can go as they please. But because of singing and praising and praying, they stay. See, it's easy for us sometimes to say, man, God couldn't possibly save them. But in this particular story, look at this. After just a few hours of hearing the name of the Lord proclaimed and praised and prayed, the prisoners stay put. Not only that, the jailer comes out in the, oh, I'm losing my part. The jailer comes out and he does what he, he knows he needs to do because the reality is, is according to Roman custom, it, here's the thing, if, you, if the prisoners escape, you would, face the same, you would face the same sentence that they would. In this case, it would be death. So the jailer knew that when, that when everybody showed up the next morning and all the prisoners were gone, that he would be killed. And so he's going to take matters into his own hands. In fact, at this moment, the jailer believes that it is hopeless and there is no hope other than to take his life. I'm going to pause real quick. Which camera am I at? Cool. I believe that there may be somebody that's watching right now or in the future, and you believe that whatever circumstance in your life right now is hopeless, that there is no other way to get out of this world, or out of this life, out of your situation, out of your circumstance, but to take your own life. And just like the jailer, that's not true because there is a hope that is found in Jesus. And if you just stick with me for a second and watch what happens to the jailer, you'll see that if you think that you're hopeless, there's hope for you the same way there was for the jailer. And so here's the thing, the jailer, right? He comes in, he's ready to take his life. Hopelessness is there. He feels like there is no other choice. And so all he decides to do is he's like, I'm gonna take my own life. And Paul yells out from the inner cell, stop, don't kill yourself, we're all here. And when the jailer goes in, suddenly he looks and he sees and he falls down trembling before Paul and Silas. Now, check this out. The jailer, who was moments away from taking his own life because of hopelessness, does this, verse 29. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? From hopelessness to an opportunity of hope. 
Sirs, what must I need to do to be saved? Not, sirs, what must I need to do to be, put you back in shackles? Sir, what must I need to do to keep you from running? Sirs, what, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Because here's the thing, the jailers heard what they said. He's been listening too. He would have been hearing their, their praises, their prayers. He would have heard about the promises of God. And all of a sudden, in this midst of the earthquake, when they could have run, they didn't run. They lived differently. They acted differently. Kids in the room, here's the thing. When you follow the ways of Jesus and you walk in his ways, people are going to be surprised. People are going to be shocked. And then people are going to ask you, what must I do to have that kind of joy? What must I do to have that kind of hope, that peace, that love? How do I live what you, how you're living? How do I have what you have? And look at what Paul and Silas say. They don't break into like, well, theologically, let me tell you what it is. Actually, here's the thing. What you have to do is you have to, like, we need to go back outside. And by the way, jailer, remember the, the 40 lashes or the 39 lashes that you put on me? Uh, I'm going to do that to you so that we can get, be even Stephen. Because the reality is, is that there's a very good chance that that jailer, if he wasn't the one that administered the rod, he was there. But there's a good chance that he was actually the one that was inflicting them. And so Paul and Silas don't look at him and go, you, Psh, you can't be saved. They look at him and they say these words. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. Somebody say free. 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 free, free, free. See, it's not just one freedom here. Paul and Silas aren't the only ones that are free. Suddenly the jailer is free. We got double freedom, right? Double freedom. Wait a minute. Uh-oh. Did you hear it? He said something about his household. His household isn't there. The jailer is the only one there. So, okay, hold up. What happens? Keep moving. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at the hour of the night, the jailer cared for them, washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household, the Greek there is every everyone is, it means everyone. He and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. <laughs> Hold up. Somebody say free. free. That's not enough. Somebody say free, free. free, free. That's not enough. I need somebody in the house to say free, free, free. Yes, that's right. It was Paul and Silas that were saved. It was the prisoners that were saved. It was the jailer that was saved. And it was his household that was saved. Why? Because Paul and Silas chose to worship when they could have stayed silent, when they could have complained, when they could have hurt, when they could have been caught in their circumstance. And not only that, did you catch it? The jailer who was at the point of hopelessness, to the point of taking debt himself, taking his own life, welcomes them into his house. And moments after he went from hopelessness to the point of suicide, he's rejoicing with his family and praising God. He and everyone in his household rejoiced because they all believed in God. Here's a funny thing. If you continue to read the story, you're going to find out that the next day, the magistrates and the people of the town decide to let Paul and Silas go. So Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas had to endure affliction they had to endure an attack, being falsely accused, being beaten, and being imprisoned for just one night so that a man and his family could be saved. I'm going to talk to the Rev students real quick, real quick, real quick, real quick. Cool, cool, cool. I know some of you are over here, some back there, but here's the thing. In your schools right now, there are people who are walking around thinking that they have no hope. Here's the thing. The jailer looked like he had it all together. 
He was a, he was a good jailer. He took care of them. And obviously, they trusted him enough to put Paul and Silas and other prisoners in his care. But yet, even though it looked like he was fine, he wasn't. And it took Paul and Silas going to the place that he was at, seeing where he was at, seeing the hurt that he was at, and being willing to praise and proclaim and tell the promises of God in the midst of that so that he could be saved. Some of you go to some pretty challenging schools, some dark schools. Sometimes I know, like I've talked to some of you Rev students and you say, man, it's just hard to tell people about Jesus. I'm a big believer that this generation right now is gonna be the generation that brings revival back to America. And I don't mean just revival in terms of like, we're gonna fill stadiums with praise and worship, although that's gonna be great. We might do that and we already are. I believe that this generation though is gonna be the generation that when the hardship comes and it will come, that they know the promises because they ask the questions. They will praise and pray in the midst of the persecution because they know the promises. And when they do, revival will come. People will be changed. The poor will be taken care of. The orphans, the widows will be taken care of. Suddenly the city will look different and there will be a divide. But when we can be like Paul and we can be like Silas, you guys are going to lead the way. One of my favorite things that happens on Sunday mornings is the group of students that comes up front and starts to worship at the stage. Here's the thing. If you come to Rev, and you should, on a, Re on a Rev Rally Wednesday night, what you'll see is you'll see 200 students all up here at the stage proclaiming and worshiping God. And the reason that they do it isn't because of religious routine or obligation. They do it because they want to praise and worship for what he's doing, praise and worship him for what he's doing in his life. And I think, I think here's the thing. I think that you guys are, are the ones that are going to genuinely lead the church the same way that your parents have trained you up. Now, that being said, I need to talk to the parents real quick. Parents in the room, because I believe this, because I, I, again, and I, I, I mean, I'd say that I could be wrong, but I'd be lying to you and I don't want to do that. <laughs> Parents, we have this great opportunity to train our children up to, to know the Lord. We have, like, here's the thing. The reason that Paul and Silas were able to do that, here's the thing. They didn't have, they didn't have a Bible in the prison with them. But they were self-fed well enough that because they were self-fed, they had memorized the scriptures, they knew the scriptures, they understood the scriptures, and so they could trust the scriptures when they were in their hardest, darkest moments. When the, when the, when the jailer came to them and said, sirs, what must, I need to, what must I do to be saved? They followed the prompting of the Spirit. Here's the thing. Sometimes the Holy Spirit takes us to places that are wonderful and glorious, and sometimes the Holy Spirit takes us to the hard places. If you remember, right after Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit led him out into the wilderness for 40 days of, of testing. When we walk spirit-led, it doesn't mean that everything is gumdrops and rainbows and, and sparkles. Oftentimes, the Holy Spirit will take us to prisons. It'll take us to wilderness. It'll take us to challenging places so that the Holy Spirit can work through us powerfully, mightily, as we walk in a sent life. By the way, have you picked this up? Here at Love Church, we talk a lot about the one, the two, the five. And it's easy to sometimes like let that be uh, white noise in the background. But the reality is, is that we see all five at work right here. We see Paul and Silas that are surrendered. We see that together they are surrounded. And later on, the two of them would be surrounded by prisoners, a jailer, and his household as they worship together and praise God. They, they were so self-fed that they knew the promises of God. They trusted them and they were walking, being spirit-led, even if it meant going to prison because they knew that their call was not just to worship in a, in a synagogue, but it was to worship in a sent lifestyle wherever they went. Surrendered, surrounded, spirit-led, self-fed, and sent. Parents, we get the opportunity to model this for our kids first and foremost by getting in the Word of God. Man, I can't stress this enough. Take the time to read the word with your kids and watch the change in your household. I'm gonna ask you a question. If I pulled your kids up here right now, and this isn't a shame, please, 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 please don't hear shame in this. 
If I pulled your kids up here right now and I said, what's the most important thing to your mom or your dad? Would they say Jesus? Would they say, I know that the most important thing because of what they've modeled with me, the time that we spent, the amount of time that we spent in worship and in the Bible and in prayer and in living lives that look like Jesus, they would say Jesus? Or would they say, oh man, I think the most important thing to my mom and dad is their job or sports or money. Here's the thing, your job is important. Having kids get around other kids and and play sports, it's important. Money, we gotta pay the bills. If it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. Whatever it is that they might say, maybe they would even say, man, I, I feel like Clash of Clans is more important to my parents. I feel like Netflix is more important. I feel like whatever it might be is more important. And here's the thing, I don't want our kids to grow up like that, parents. I want Love Church to be known as the place that's training up the next generation to go into the world, to live sent lives. And it starts by simply sitting down and reading the word with them. You heard it earlier. What do they say? Uh, It takes five to, Denise, you said five to 10 minutes. Okay, let's just, let's just push that up a little bit. Let's say it takes an hour. One hour out of a 24 hour day to some, like, where's my mathematicians? What's the percentage on that? It's 124, is that right? I feel like it's less than 10%, right? And here's the thing, as we are faithfully willing to give back 10% of our money to the Lord. We say, Lord, I give back to you just a little bit about what you've given to me. Would you be willing to take 10% and give it with your, the kids that he's given to you? I'm going to spend 10% of my day training up my children to know you, Lord. That would be 2.4, 2.4 hours, whatever it is. I don't know. Math, fun, 2.4, cool, carry the three. So two and a half hours. Okay, listen, the Orange Bible will take you 30 minutes. By the way, if you're like, but I want to teach my kids how to memorize verses, there's all sorts of ways to do that. One of my favorite ones is there's an app. It's called Verses, literally called Verses. It's like $5.99 and you actually get to play a game and move around like all all the things to try to put them in the right order and memorize the verse in a way that's very like fun and creative. Here's the thing, whatever you do, parents, you have this opportunity and I need need you to hear this. If you felt shame when I said, if I brought your kids up here, you were like, oh man, my kid would say X, Y, Z. Here's the thing, I, I don't care where you've been. You can't go back and change the past, but you can create a new future. So I dare you, parents, to take the 30-day Orange Bible Challenge. I I triple dog dare you. Because here's the thing, I'm convinced that in the next 30 days, what you'll start to see is you'll start to see your kids start to fall in love with the Orange Bible. Yes, they'll be bouncing off the walls. Yes, they'll be running all around. Yes, it'll seem like they're not making sense. But here's the thing, sometimes the 30-day Bible Challenge is not just for your kids, it's for you. So we have the opportunity to start here. Here's the thing. You want to live a life, a 5S life, surrendered, surrounded, spirit-led, self-fed, and sent? Today, I'm challenging you to start with self-fed. Because there are some of you in this room right now that you feel like you've been attacked, that you've been beat down, that you've been imprisoned, that you're in a place, in a season of life that's struggling. Maybe it's with your kids. Maybe it's with your job. Maybe it's in your marriage. But what I'm telling you is this, that sometimes the Holy Spirit has you in that jail, has you in that place, has you exactly where you are so that you can do amazing and abundant things the ways that you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And I could talk